Hi, everybody. This is the book club of the Pluriversal Design Special Interest Group, um, which is a group of the Design Research Society. Okay. And we make these meetings public and open, um, but actually there's supposed to be a little closed club and you're supposed to be a DRS member, but we're very, very happy to open it, open up the conversation to other people um, who have like interests. And then that way you get to know about the Design Research Society and the work that we do and, and stuff like that. So, um, so my name is, is Leslie Ann Noel. I'm going to mute a few people. And if I mute you, don't feel offended. You can unmute when you're ready. Um, so my name is Leslie Ann Noel, and I'm the co-chair of um, the Pluriversal Design SIG. And um, I'm a professor of practice at Tulane University in New Orleans. So I survived Hurricane Zeta day before yesterday, and we're OK. Right. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Renata Leitong, who is the other co-chair of this group. Yes, I, I'm a Brazilian too, too. Today it's a very Brazilian day. And I teach at Tocad University in Toronto. And I have to say that uh, Pedagogia do Primeiro, the Pedagogy of the Press, is one of my favorite books ever ever i've ever always referred to this book in my work and i think that even if paulo freire wrote about um, uh, uh, literacy learning to read and write it can apply to design completely completely and it's something that i really i always talk to leslie we should write more about it how to link some elements of the pedagogy of the press with our work as designers so i'm super super excited to 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 hear fred uh, fred's presentation today so i can you introduce yourself <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Leslie Ann, for the invitation. Um, so my name is Frederick, but uh, you can call me Fred. So I'm speaking from Curitiba, which is south of Brazil. I'm currently, this is the place where Leslie Ann studied uh, for her uh, initial um, uh, course in, in design in, at Federal University of Paraná. That's the place where I also studied. But yeah, however, there's I also oh, you too. Oh, good. <laughs> but I'm currently at uh, Federal University of Technology, so we have two federal universities in this same city. So don't get confused. <laughs> and uh, my university has a chair in service design and experience design. This is the first in the in the in the country. That's um, the one that I'm occupying right now. And formally I've been, uh, oh, good. Yes, good. Continue. Yes, formally Cefetch. Exactly. So this is going to be um, a short book summary, uh, which is not going to be a literal uh, translation or a, a literal summary of exactly what is written in this book. I will try basically to convey the main uh, concepts that I find interesting in this book. And I might run into some kind of oversimplification or maybe even something um, that I'm trying to extrapolate from the, my reading. but just uh, we can't correct anything like that if I go over what's possible uh, during uh, the discussion session that we will uh, have after my presentation. So um, let me give you an introduction about the context uh, where this book was being was written. Paulo Freire, he just he developed a literacy method for edu education in a country that in this 60, between the 50s and the 60s had more than 70% of uh, illiterate people. And uh, politicians, they use this opportunity, of course, to buy uh, votes and to deceive people all the time. So they didn't want uh, this kind of uh, education and extending a massive education for the population. So uh, they, uh, once the the military education stabilized in military uh, government stabilized in Brazil in 64. Paulo Freire has been uh, uh, persecuted and he was imprisoned, imprisoned. And in 68, he was in political exile. And then he wrote uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, he believed 
firmly that education was key to denounce and to fight oppression. And he has experienced and saw how these people that have been, um, uh, that acquired literacy in, in very short amount of time, 40 hours experience in Angicos, which is a small city in the Northeast of Brazil, that they really became citizens with uh, all their powers and the knowledge that they needed to avoid being uh, um, fooled by the oppressors. So they could uh, really engage in a more uh, conscious uh, way their life and developing their own livelihoods. And the basic concept behind uh, the pedagogy of the oppressed and the notion of oppression is the historical dialectical relationship that uh, Paulo Freire is drawing from Marx and especially Hegel. Hegel has been has wrote, wrote about uh, the master slave dialectics and Marx extended that through a historical perspective once he uh, spoke about the, the, the struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And Paulo Freire really used this uh, relationship all the time. And I will present a major uh, the dialectical relationships that I read in his uh, book, although he does not present them always in the same way, in a more schematic way that I'm presenting here. This might be the part of what I'm oversimplifying, but I hope that this will perhaps help you engage into a meaningful conversation. So this relationship is composed of three elements, a social force A, uh, the opposite social force, which is B, and a third force, which might appear or might not appear, that comes out of the struggle with these, these two different forces. And these two different forces struggle in action. It's not just um, an abstraction, dialect, a historical dialectic relationship. It's not just a combination of different ideas. It does not happen in the minds of people, but really happens in action. So there are historical actions from one force to the other. Let me give you then applying this uh, abstract model to a concrete situation, which is oppression, which is the basic uh, historical dialectical relationship that uh, Paulo Freire is looking uh, in this book. So for Paulo Freire, there is a, a, the, the, the world is divided into two social groups. One social group which is historically privileged and the other group who is historically underprivileged. And the oppressors, they try to dehumanize, underestimate, prescribe behavior and exclude and especially negate the possibility of the oppressed of becoming or being human. They would say, the oppressors would say that the oppressed cannot do that. They just have, are not capable and they should not be treated as a full human being. Uh, however, the oppressed uh, in oppression relations also tries to react to the actions of the oppressors. And they try to regain their, their humanity uh, by reacting directly to oppression, by organizing and reacting more collectively, by criticizing the oppressors, by resisting and looking for their own liberation. And while they try to liberate themselves, the oppressed also liberate oppressors from this relationship, which also prevents the oppressors uh, from developing fully as a human because they depend on the oppressed and oppressed depends on the oppressors. And this relationship is not a, uh, it's, it's not a, a good relationship for both of them. Although the oppressor thinks they, they are in power, but they are also not developing ethically. They are not developing as full human beings because they uh, somehow do something which is considered something. He does not say that Paulo Freire does not separate the world like good and bad and the evil and the, the nice people. But uh, the oppressors, they do not develop fully. They could develop much more if they didn't depend on the oppressed. And Paulo Freire also believes that there is a third possibility that once uh, oppressed engaged uh, against the oppressors in their liberating actions, they May become, they may create a new kind of a man who is not oppressor, neither an oppressed. It's a man in the process of liberation. This is the third force. This is what uh, Paulo Freire is really looking to support with this pedagogy of the oppressed. 
he uh, moves forward in his book to analyze the case of banking education, which is a specific uh, oppression that is uh, manifest in education. And, and it's also, I would say, the basic um, way how oppression is historically um, maintained in society. And that's why he is um, uh, trying to denounce banking education. He believes firmly that education, as I said, is the way to go against oppression. So first has to criticize how oppression manifests into education. And he, draw, he makes an analogy uh, with uh, banking systems where knowledge is, knowledge is considered a thing that can be deposited in the student's heads as if the student may or may not use the knowledge in the future. So the teachers, they might they are responsible for uh, programming the content to be transmitted <laughs> to the students uh, through lecturing and also through disciplining because the students should abide. They should uh, understand how to behave according to the uh, disciplinary knowledge. And teachers ultimately, they try to inform students what, uh, what is the reality and how does reality works so the students can adapt or, and also accept to that reality and never to transform that reality. Students, they are treated as a tabula rasa, as someone who does not have anything to offer and the teacher has everything to offer. So students are expected to receive, to listen, memorize, repeat and accept reality. However, he, uh, Paulo Freire and his colleagues and that who worked uh, with him in the Angicos City, they started developing a new way of approaching education, which is not, he's called, he calls that pedagogy of the press, but later on, this became known as critical pedagogy, which is based on the, on different practices, and especially a different relationship between teachers and students. So teachers, they still possess um, some kind of knowledge, which is considered superior, Paul Freire does not Equal, equalize scientific knowledge to experiential knowledge that students have. However, Paulo Freire says that experiential knowledge is also an, some kind of knowledge, very important, and this should be the starting point of the critical pedagogy process. So before you start lecturing, if you need to, you first need to know what do the students know already. So it's a kind of a starting from the demand instead of starting from what it can offer. And how do you do that? So you do some uh, investigation about the themes of uh, that can um, somehow engage students meaningfully with understanding their reality. Uh, this is also a very important practice that will generate uh, participatory action research and also participatory design. This is the main um, technique that will uh, generate a lot of different interesting discussions on the on um, uh, human sciences and also humanities. And uh, this deem investigation is also done together with the students. So it's kind of a participatory approach, a co-investigation, as he says, as he says. Uh, you go through a reflective action, understanding how do you do and why do you do things, and you try to change your action and you engage in a meaningful dialogue, you pose problems or problem posing education, and you aim at conscientization, which is a, a word that exists in Portuguese, conscientização, and I believe it's nice, although it does not exist in English, this word, to translate as conscientization. If uh, we do that, this translation to Portuguese, uh, we have a lot of uh, English neologisms in Portuguese, why don't we have uh, English neologism that comes from a Portuguese word. So I, 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 I mind about translating that, I mean. <laughs> and uh, the students, as I said, they are doing basically engaging the same kind of activity. So here you see there's no asymmetry between the actions of one social group and the other social group, because the goal is to uh, focus on the same object, which is reality and the world around the students. So transforming that reality is the outcome uh, of critical pedagogy. But this goes much further because uh, Paulo Freire is not just looking at education, as I said, he's, saying, he's saying, looking at education as a kind of a means for something much broader, which is um, fighting another 
another uh, oppression, which he does not directly name it, but uh, later on, some readers, some commentators, they said it's colonization. Therefore, Paulo Freire is also considered um, one of the one of the authors that are related to decolonizing and post-colonial readings and decolonial and all kinds of different uh, uh, movements. Uh, but Paulo Freire calls that cultural invasion, and cultural invasions uh, is a kind of a imposing a worldview. Uh, against from one superior culture to an inferior culture. The superior culture is considered developed, fully developed, uh, the best and the, the top uh, of society and the world. And uh, that world is much better than the inferior culture, the undeveloped world. And so it has to, the, the first world has to invade the third world basically and colonize because that's the way the colonized can develop themselves. However, we know that, uh, and Paulo Freire also knows, and he denounces that the colonizers, the oppressors, they take advantage of this colonization and, it, and they leave very little um, for the colonized. And some, it's unbalanced uh, activity, as you can see here from the actions. So the colonizers impose the worldview, cultivate values, conquer. Um, he, they don't. They do. They are violent against the colonized, and they are authoritarian. And the colonized, they just have to house the oppressors. It's kind of a very interesting um, understanding of the, the oppression relationship. The colonized, they, it has the colonizer inside himself, telling things and um, shaping the behavior from the inside. And so the colonized fear and obey and follow and even mimic, try to be like the colonizer. So the dream of the colonized is to become a colonizer and act as if it was, he was the colonizer. So it's kind of a, 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 a relationship that has been analyzed by other authors. But in this, uh, uh, in this book, he's trying to use cultural invasion to build up cultural synthesis, which is the, the proposal, the bigger, larger proposal that he uh, believes that education can contribute. So he says, there's no revolution that will uh, break from out from colonization that does not uh, go through some kind of a critical pedagogy and, and uh, some kind of education. And he's addressing the last chapter of this book, the revolutionary leaders. So people that engage into some uh, decolonizing fights and uh, even wars, although he does not mention uh, directly that uh, the context was precisely the, the time when the, the, in Latin America, there were a lot of uh, revolutionary wars. And uh, I would uh, tell a little bit more about that later, but just like finish the, the, the scheme. Here you see revolutionary leaders on the left who are, they came from the oppressors group, they are typically privileged people, but they understand that there's a, a big social injustice and they want to fight against that. So they join the oppressed people or either they stay in a um, triangle relationship where they are uh, not neither oppressors, neither oppressed. So this is a kind of um, a part where Paulo Freire does not explain very well, but revolutionary leaders, uh, they are committed to the liberation of the oppressed people. And they cooperate, they learn from the oppressed, they investigate their reality and what can be done to overcome oppression. And they try to plan together a new kind of a society. So the goal of uh, this uh, relationship between revolutionary leaders and oppressed people, this cooperation will lead to cultural revolution. And once uh, Paulo Freire says that he mentions Mao Zedong and uh, China Revolution, not directly, but you as uh, you can read between the lines that he's um, looking forward a kind of cultural revolution in Latin America and critical pedagogy would be some kind of uh, a basic methodology for that to happen. And also you can uh, read between the lines that Paulo Freire believes that cultural revolution in China and other places, they haven't been so successful for the lack of uh, uh, an educational pedagogy and uh, revolutionary education pedagogy. So he really believed that uh, the, the press, they could uh, create, make history and not just understand and learn history. 
And he focuses on the examples. Once he says, he talks about oppressed in this book, he's talking about the peasants in Latin America, because he was, uh, the Angico City experiment that he joined in the, in the, in the 60s was exactly done in a, in a peasant uh, community. And he, later on after he had to uh, uh, go, go outside of Brazil due to the political situation, he joined uh, the uh, revolutionary forces in Chile. And he also helped uh, to teach uh, peasants because they were trying to follow this uh, model that Cuba and uh, especially Che Guevara had uh, pioneered instead of insufflating the masses in the cities that had a close connection to the power, they went in the rural areas and they convinced the peasants that they uh, were overly oppressed and they had to do something. And that's how where this, the strength of the Cuban revolution came from. This indeed have worked out in many places in Latin America and other places might not have worked well. But in Brazil, still, we have the, the, the strongest um, social movement we have here. It's the landless movement, the MST, who are really st still uh, today a strong uh, social uh, force and uh, political force. To summarize uh, Pedagogy of the Press, the book, uh, in, this, in one uh, sentence, it is a pedagogy which must be forged with, not for the oppressed, whether individuals or people in this incessant struggle to regain their humanity. So it's a kind of a revolutionary education approach. And I would just provide you some very quick glimpse on the elements of the method, who's, which is known as uh, Paulo Freire method. Although Freire does not say this is a method and he does not really like this kind of a, uh, prescription, but some people would use this as a kind of a translating his ideas to more uh, structured approach for education. Uh, the main elements are cultural circles and uh, deem investigation. The cultural circle, uh, it's a kind of a group of people uh, that from a, a, a community that is local, localized to learn, that join to learn and transform their cultural reality. And it's not like a classroom, a traditional classroom that follows some kind of a curriculum. It's really about the issues, the, the things that people are living in their life, the struggles they live in their life are brought to this the cultural circle through a participatory research that even uh, the students themselves, they join, they would go on the community, walking around, taking notes, talking to people to understand the thematic universe and specifically finding limit situations. Limit situations are when the contradictions are much stronger in this, that society. And then well, the situations when oppression is really strong and then you can more like easily understand and distinguish it. And this becomes a generative theme, a theme that will, which will be brought to the discussion and that will generate further discussions, also further themes. That's why it's called a generative theme. This is an example of how the generative dean is coded uh, using some um, very simple language. And here you see a, a very explicit connection to design, although he does not use that word directly, but here you see uh, these limit situations coded in a way that uh, illiterate people could understand and have a meaningful conversation. On the right side, on the left side, you see Paulo Freire and his colleagues using a very advanced technology for his time, which was the slide projection. This was not available in many places in Brazil. This was really an innovation of that time. And he brought to these very uh, poor villages that never saw such a uh, technology and even they ha didn't have electricity sometimes. And then he would project on the, on the on the wall, uh, some images of um, familiar situations in their life, but specific situations when the oppression can could be un, uh, recognized, as in the, the moment where the people would vote and choose the represent the representatives in the political official situation of the, the city or even the state, and he would uh, teach people how to read uh, uh, voto povo, which is which are vote and people and try to discuss what does that mean? Can vote really change that society? These are, were the questions that he would ask, the problems that the, the teacher would pose 
to these uh, people joining the cultural circle and really trying to understand the contradiction behind vote and voting uh, and the problems if you just accept someone, a politician bargaining to buy your vote, which was something very common at that time, they would, the politicians would bring uh, medicines, they would bring food, and in exchange for that, uh, the citizen would have to vote for that politician. So you had to teach people to think critically about what the politicians were telling them. And Paulo Freire has written a lot of different books. Uh, it's very extensive, his publications, not all, all of them have been translated into English, but it's a pity that the design uh, field uh, does not usually refer to other works of him. And that's why I have this slide with some three major works that have been translated into English. And I really like them. And I really think they, uh, you can understand much better uh, Paulo Freire's thinking and relate to design with these three other books. Pedagogy of the Press is really a book about revolution. <laughs> if you're not in the business of revolution, you might find it hard to draw relationships. Those three other books, they are, I would say they are less uh, aggressive in their language. And they also uh, really trying to, especially Pedagogy of Freedom, which is uh, the, his major work, is really uh, thinking uh, about the situation that we live right now. Because in the, in the 60s, as I said, in Latin America, it was really a moment where um, cultural evolution was possible. I wouldn't say this is possible nowadays. Uh, so what was valid for that time might not be valid for our times, but pedagogy of freedom is much, uh, much more uh, relevant to our current days. It was written in the 90s, so it has a lot of interesting relationships. So I really invite you to know more about Paulo Freire. So that's it. Sorry if I have uh, oversimplified the matters. And thank you for listening. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so for me, that was like fantastic. I'm going to put up my little emoji kind of reaction. Um, I've read Pedagogy of the Oppressed several times. And um, I think Fred, I, so I, I met Fred, if we could say met in this virtual world, um, at the participatory um, design conference in, in June. Or I first saw Fred there and, and then I was able to see you. Did, I think I did not know you yet, Fred, but I watched, Fred G, <laughs> but I watched the, um, you did a presentation about um, what does Fred have to do with design, which I watched on YouTube. And I thought, oh my goodness, somebody else gets it because my PhD is kind of grounded or rooted in Freire, but actually I did it in a kind of roundabout way because I've read Freire and I, I just took a note here of some other authors that you can read who also make Freire accessible. Uh, Freire is accessible. It's easy reading and it's very short. It's four chapters, I think, um, but Bell Hooks um, also is in conversation with Freya, Ira Shaw, who is the person that I um, refer to much more in my PhD, um, is also talking about Freya and empowering education. And then Donaldo Macedo, who Freya also co-authored um, some writings with. So um, I have some questions that I wanna throw out to people to see where we could get this. And then Fred, since this is also your session, um, you could also throw out some additional questions. But the first question that I'm gonna take is the question that you, of the, which was the name of your presentation, right? You know, so what does this have to do with design? <laughs> and I don't know if anybody now wants to um, jump in and see what does this have to do with us as designers? You know, this um, pedagogy around liberation and oppression and we're designers. Why are we talking about this stuff? <laughs> I'm going to add some of my favorite quotes that are so <laughs> much about design. Yes. Yeah, I think the Freire talks about of infusing the world with our creative presence. That's something that is so linked to design. So linked. Freire is yes. not using the word design, but he used the word project somewhere in this book. And mm -hmm. he's saying that projects are really uh, some kind of uh, specific skill that man has that differentiates it from uh, other animals. Mm -hmm. 
so that man has this particular ability of overseeing himself in the future and trying to change uh, the situation around in the reality so that it would uh, not ad the, the, him, he would not so man would not adapt himself to the nature but instead would change nature to adapt to himself and while doing that he would create history so the world that man lives and women as well because I'm sorry but uh, Paulo Freire has had uh, this trouble after he he had used this uh, uh, male uh, and, and uh, sexist language in the past in the first edition and after he met uh, bell hooks and then he corrected and started using men and women so men and women would change their reality and while while doing so they would also create a world that is based on history and not just on nature and everyone that's the main uh, issue for him everyone creates history and everyone can be conscious of how they can create history and make history and i, I think this is this is very interesting for designers because we are not somehow so aware that we are making history while we are designing things mm -hmm, and this yeah. word project that in english is not very much used but in portuguese once you translate design we translate to projetar which is exactly doing a project and that help us to understand that every moment we are doing design, we are changing uh, the na nature I and mean, we are making history, although we are making history in a, by tiny bits. <laughs> and th th that notion of history, which is uh, not a, definitely not related to this more like uh, bookish tradition of uh, history based on uh, um, major moments uh, uh, protagonized by the oppressors. That's not what the history he's talking about. He's really talking about the history that comes from everyday life. And that's the, the history that designers are really engaged. And also they should be more wary and responsible because sometimes they are making bad history. <laughs> They're really reproducing these oppressions in their designs. And this might not be a huge oppression, like uh, designers are not putting uh, people into jail that's not the kind of history designers do but they are really making people feel uncomfortable and sometimes putting people in unsafe situations based on the reproduction of uh, an oppression relation i see gloria had her hand up um i am just blown away by by what's going on today the background that we come from informs our life somehow and this is what I noticed participating in Pivot when I was reading all these wonderful documents, because suddenly I was awakened to a part of design that I thought I knew, but I didn't really know. And also becoming aware about those unconscious aspects of being a Latin American designer, doing design with technologies of the global North. It, it was just, it's like in Spanish we say, Descubrió el agua tibia. It's like I discovered Luke water. You know, it's like it was always there. It was in front of me, but for some reason I wasn't able to see it. And I feel like uh, Paulo Freire is doing that. It's like just alerting us of everything that is going around us. Thank you for Maria. that. Um, Michelle. Hi. Um, I'm just starting to read the book but I have, I use bell hooks quite a bit with my graduate students, undergraduate students. I, start, I started using her probably back in the mid nineties to do projects um, with the students. And I never, I couldn't, wasn't sure why, but I knew I wanted to bring in a different cultural context into the class. <clears throat> And I think about what Gloria said is that unbeknownst to us, we tend to bring our own cultural nomenclature into our teaching, into our classroom, into how we actually work like with practices and clients. And I like the idea of taking the word design off the table and thinking about like when you're creating, you're doing these projects, that these projects address current conditions that where you're creating for the future and delivering goods that impact the future of how people live. Thank you. That's all I have to say. 
<laughs> Thank you. But that's nice because sometimes we, we think uh, we use uh, the word design in a way that is so formal. And what if we use like praxis or other mm -hmm. words that are that, that are closer to to everybody? Yes. Yeah. It it I think it it brings more voices into the conversation when you take the word design off the table because everybody has the capacity to create something. Mm -hmm. And so how they go about doing it is different for all of us. Yeah. But I, I am going to look, I am going to look Fred up when we go back to Brazil again, but it won't yeah. be anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> you are more, more than welcome over here. I but see Tai just... had a, I, I, I don't know if you are Tai or Tai. Tai. Um, yes, so you can jump in. <laughs> Sorry, oh. Fred. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Fred, for your presentation. Uh, I have a, a comment and, uh, and a question. I, I would like to hear, I'm really curious to know how you use Paulo Freire with your uh, students. And um, particularly, I would like to know how, thing, how are things now, uh, if the reception of Paulo Freire's work has changed in any way, if you've if you've noticed um, a difference in how he's uh, perceived by, particularly by students. Um, yeah, I'm just curious to know how it is now on the ground uh, with this whole, you know, demonization of Paulo Freire's work and his uh, person, if you felt any change in, in that. And then my comment would be, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, how things uh, change and we don't know really how they're going to change. Uh, so we are uh, like uh, recording the video and um, it just crossed my mind how it's just that 10 years ago, we wouldn't really imagine that uh, maybe having Paulo Freire in your CV would be a problem in certain context, contexts in Brazil today. Um, and so I'm just thinking of how today we are generating the data that will be used against us in the future. So we have these videos of us speaking about Paulo Freire. And it's not just, it's not a comment like to be paranoid or anything. It's just, um, it, it crossed my mind right now because I worked in the, in the Paulo Freire Institute in, in Brazil in, in, uh, many, many years ago. And uh, it didn't really affect me because I guess when we are in academia, we are a bit shielded from, from that. But I know of colleagues who had to think uh, twice uh, when looking for work in other places, how uh, well it would go down having Paulo Freire in your CV now, nowadays. So I'm just um, throwing it out there, the, this, um, how do we remain critical to you know, having our video recorded and uh, that kind of thing. And yeah, I would like, love to hear from you, Fredi, about your, um, uh, how is that happening now with students? Thank you. Thank Let's you see. so much for the presentation. Thank you for your question, Ty. Uh, it's really a high time for discussing Paulo Freire with, with our students. And it, it, there's a, a uh, an interesting situation that currently we are living in Brazil, that the uh, government has started to surveil uh, professors and they have, a, they have uh, some journalists, they found a list with 500 professors around the, the, in the public universities in Brazil that were anti-fascist and they would be anti-government uh, by doing, by uh, their own thinking. And that's why, that's why they should have been surveilled I don't know if I am in this list because they haven't published the, the list. Uh, but uh, of course, this is it's, it's bad to know that we are being surveilled. It's bad to know that we may face some consequences of our actions. However, five years ago, once I started teaching using Paulo Freire and uh, others that have more like a critical perspective of a reality, students didn't want to join that, <laughs> these discussions. They said, why the hell should we discuss about this? Why in the hell should we remember the dictatorship times of Brazil? <laughs> this, is, this is over, this history is over, this chapter of history is over. <laughs> and unfortunately, this chapter is not over. It just, it was the last years we have been experiencing a really a makeover on the, the, the military dictatorship of the 70s in Brazil. And that's 
that became a very interesting generative theme for our classes. We really started to look back and, uh, and for example, just a, one example of what we have done, we've done, we've done some speculative design projects that started from the 70s to nowadays. And we, we, we changed some technology relationships on that time so that we could see what would, uh, how do, would that relate to politics and culture afterwards. And we would start from an anti-democratic situation in the 70s. How could they come to a really fully democratic society? And what was the role of technology and interaction design in the uh, democratic um, uh, struggle? So instead of changing the how, um, we teach, we really change uh, what we teach uh, once we approach critical pedagogy. It's not really about a, me a specific method that you have to apply. It's really about uh, bringing in the limit situations to our um, uh, classroom. So we, we bring reality, but it's not any kind of reality. It's not just about bring everyday life because this is what designers, design education does all the time. So it's always about everyday life. But everyday life is not um, uh, full of opportunities for um, intervening. You really, we really have to select the sit limit situations, which are situations that can be changed and transformed. And once people perceive that they are being oppressed in that situation, they can fight. And if we bring this to students, they really get um, excited. And of course, they also f fear for uh, having some backlash in the future. But in this situation, as strong as it is, the surveillance, the reactionarism, the strongest students are engaged with our uh, critical pedagogy classes. So I, uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's a high time. I, I want to um, presumptuously add <laughs> to, to what you have said, Fred, because um, so like I don't discuss Freya in class, but Freya is there. You know, and so like, you know, if, if we ask, you know, if I come back to that original question that Fred posted, what does this have to do with design? You know, Laura put in a comment about the banking model of education in universities. And so art and design education isn't always, um, there are a lot of spaces in art and design education that are not about banking, um, ab about a banking approach. But there are places where we can definitely break that. And so that's what I mean when I say like Freya is there in my classes because I'm using, I'm making sure that there isn't a banking model, you know, using generative themes, um, kind of transferring some of the power um, in the class to the students where I'm really trying to find out how are they, um, you know, what is the knowledge that they're bringing into the assignments, you know, and then focusing on um, oppression and liberation and transformation. Um, so, you know, like I never thought of actually discussing him, but actually, yes, we, I should bring him as a text earlier on. But the way that um, that I teach my design classes is, is really very, um, very inspired by Freya and by um, Ira Shaw. Lucia Garces has a very interesting uh, comment here in the chat. Lucia is telling she's uh, joined, um, she got to know uh, critical pedagogy through the work of Professor Alvaro Vieira Pinto, who is mentioned in the critical pedagogy of the press book twice or thrice. And specifically, uh, he's credited for this concept of limited situation. And Alvaro Vieira Pinto, uh, he wrote extensively about the philosophy of technology, but his writings have been just discovered 10 years ago. And they, they have been hidden for a long time, especially because he was also in exile and so on. And he has, Alvaro Vieira Pinto has a design uh, theory. It's incredible. And I'm just reading right now in the last months. It's, in, um, it's very interesting for those who are searching for epistemologies of the South to look for different kind of uh, design theories. And he, one of the concepts be in the, his design theory is the limit situation, which is kind of a situation that everything can change, everything can happen in that situation because oppression is really uh, uh, explicit in that situation. If you could add something to that, Lucia Garces, I'm really curious, how did you come, how did you find Vira Pinto, which is, which is really not well known and referred in the English um, 
academic uh, environment. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Freddy, for your presentation. And also, to, uh, thank you uh, for reading my comment. I, I'm not read the books of Vieira Pinto that you mentioned, but I uh, read that in the book of the pedagogy of the press. And that was something that the uh, limit situations make me uh, have this uh, connection that is really direct with the way that we practice design. You know, we uh, took, for example, the idea of uh, a problem and try to think in a different ways to solve that problem. So that's what I think about it. Um, but I would like to ask you if maybe you could send us the, this other biography about Vieira Pinto because I'm really interesting, interested to read about it. Nice. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting uh, question because we pa Paulo Freire uses the word problem posing, and we might uh, think that this is the same as problem solving, <laughs> and it's completely the opposite. <laughs> problem posing. Uh, some I think it's a bad translation because uh, I would prefer problematization, which is really what he uh, like uh, the direct neologism that you could draw from problematization. And problematization means that you pose a problem and another problem and another problem and another problem. So you're really trying to see uh, the underneath problems behind the problem. So you don't just do not accept the first problem to solve it. So the task of the students that have problems posed is not to solve them <laughs> directly. It's really to pose another problem. So it's a conversation about problems, a dialogue specifically uh, uh, in Freire's words. However, limit situations, they are not problems. Uh, and Freire does not explain that um, very well because uh, limit situations, they are more like uh, a contradiction than a problem. And a contradiction is, like, Freire uses this word around, around uh, across the, the book. It's not something that can be solved, can be resolved. And this is uh, a, 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 a tiny difference that makes a lot of difference because a contradiction is more like a, a structure feature of a society. And you do not get rid of that that easily. It's not just something that you can start a project and you solve a contradiction. No, you have to change, transform reality. So you have need a cultural evolution to resolve a contradiction. And it's possible, but it's more like utopian thinking and something that, uh, designers are, it's out of the scope of a design project, I would say. However, we can use limit situations to stimulate people to become aware of these limit situations and specifically about the contradictions that are behind those limit situations. So people could act and do these kind of uh, little history making actions towards a larger history making action, which will be a uh, re uh, cultural revolution or something else like that. So it's, 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 not, it's something that we have to be very uh, aware that problem solving in design discourse has done a lot of uh, good for some, some people, but for the oppressed, this is usually not the case because they solve the first world problems with problem solving, not uh, really the limit situations of the oppressed. And that's why Freire with problem posing is really the opposite approach, I would say. And I don't see this uh, idea of design as uh, changing the courses of action and uh, for creating a situation that's more preferable as a uh, traditional problem solving design theory would say from Herbert Simon and others. I believe that um, the, the major difference is that the problems and the, the solutions, they're all contradictory. The, the reality is not uh, something that can be resolved, uh, solved and become homogeneous and, and something that does not have any contradiction. Contradictions will never go away. It's a feature of the reality from the perspective of a um, historical materialistic uh, perspective that uh, Freire has adopted in this book and other books in the, book, but in the subsequent work. And Nicole is mentioning wicked problems. Yeah, I would say that wicked problems is more like a, uh, a, uh, an approach to try to regain some uh, reality, uh, realism in the problem solving literature, but it's still very much uh, focused on trying to 
do something with a project and with a rational mind. Uh, and I believe that Paulo Freire is not talking about a rational project once he's talking about project. He really is talking about the collective projects of uh, new societies, which is a much broader approach. But maybe someone wants to jump in the dis discussion or move to another topic. Afraid, I, I have I have a question. In in my, for instance, I have come across uh, of authors or with I have worked with um, some readings from authors who have referred the work of Freire in their research and and their practice. For, for instance, um, Os Osubel, he um, and Joseph Nova Novak. They also use Freire in the research back in the 60s and 70s. So have you come across? Because the thing is that for me as a Latin American, sometimes I, I'm afraid of bringing these concepts into my work. It's, yeah, because of many conscious or unconscious reasons. But other academics for the last 40 years have cited work with these concepts. Have you? come across this in your own research to see how other disciplines have embraced these concepts without being worried about it, you know? But for some reason, we in Latin America, for several, many reasons, I mean, I know some of them. So it would be interesting for, because when I started rediscovering these readings, I said, oh, I read such and such and mentioned this work. How, and then there is another lens into that. Perhaps it's a way for us designers as well to, to, to help us see how it has benefited other kinds of research or, you know, in other areas. What do you think uh, about that? One day someone asked uh, Bruno Latour, why didn't he refer to uh, Michel Foucault in his works? And he says, I'm French and we have Mich uh, Michel Foucault in our blood. And, I and this is a completely different cultural situation. When people in, in France, they really, um, they have more open democratic societies that they can really read Foucault and discuss Foucault openly. And that's not the case with Paulo Freire in Brazil. So we don't have Paulo Freire in our blood and our education system is not constructed, the official education system in Brazil is not constructed based on Paulo Freire's ideas. I would say that Paulo Freire has been more influential outside Brazil than inside. And the example that I, of my story with Paulo Freire really um, proves so. But um, my, my, my story too, because I studied in a school in Curitiba that was, my teachers were influenced by Paulo Freire, but I just discovered uh, Paulo Freire when I moved to Canada. It was the same thing. Well, uh, I, I asked uh, Natalie Pinto, you raised your hand. Do you have a question? Uh, not really a question. I just wanted to add something um, that it's kind of, has kind of been discussed. Uh, I think that some you started, uh, first of all, Fred, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. And also I noticed that some of us met before in the PD conference of last year, right? <laughs> so it was an interesting, um, it, it was interesting to find out of these two facts. The fact that you started this presentation talking about Pelen and how he talked about how PD started in the North, uh, Northern countries. and. Also, there was a question regarding how the Paulo Freire uh, work connects to design. So even though uh, participatory design has been, it's known, it's worldly known now, we still, uh, we, the, the designers that come from Latin America are still trying to find ways in which we can um, somehow, um, position it or work and make work that is more relevant to where we come from, right? So every time that we are referring to something, we have to refer back to other uh, designers that are uh, from, that are not situated or contextualized in our experience. So this doesn't mean that it's not important to look uh, um, to other places. But for example, if we look how Paulo Freire uh, was, was conceived or was developed in the Northern countries, we see participation as a matter of empowerment for citizens that were already citizens, right? If we see participation, I believe, and this is something uh, kind of a provocation, 
in our countries or in Latin America, for example, participation is more about uh, emancipation. So that proposes that when we feed our design with this kind of theorization of participation, the outcomes are going to be different or feed in a different way. Um, yeah. So that I would just want to throw that uh, out there and see what you guys think. Um, well, um, I would say that uh, it's very difficult to uh, to compare different cultural situations and uh, use a method as a bridge between these different cultures. So if you are doing participatory design in Sweden and following one, uh, the same four steps and you are doing in Brazil, you will get a uh, different situation because culture really, uh, over, uh, it, it, it's something much broader, much more influencing than a method. It's really create the whole reality culture. And in Brazil participation usually is something that people on the bottom are trying to do by themselves so they can become a stronger political force. And in the North, it's usually the case of the top of society. They are trying to become more attuned to the bottom. So it's it starts from the top society. It's not like uh, social movements that are really pioneering participatory approaches in Brazil. This is completely different than the North when you would say that universities or uh, government agencies or even um, uh, class associations or union, trade unions. These, these are not the bottom-up movements, I would say. Bottom-up movements are really like the landless movement. <laughs> these guys are really, they don't have anything. They really have to join together. If they are not participatory, they can't really survive. So it's a different story, <laughs> I would say. And of course, participatory design has a lot of interesting uh, tools that can be appropriated in the South. And we have done this extensively, but we definitely have some other ways of doing uh, participation and something else, something else which uh, might not be just participation that uh, would go much further in, the, in looking to these limited situations and trying to overcome contradictions. So problematizing, it looks like it's just a phase. It's just a, a, a moment in the process. But this is really at the core of uh, critical pedagogy and problematizing is not just something it's something that you also produce as a result of a design project so the result is a problem posed to society and society would have to work out that so there's a lot of interesting possible new ways of doing design from the epistemologies of the south and i believe that this pluriversal design book club here is really doing a great job on uh, stimulating you to think from this perspective. And as I mentioned, the work of Alvaro Vieira Pinto and there's many others here that have an original thinking uh, that could be uh, inspiring for designers like Augusto Ball and the, with the theater of the press, which is yeah. amazing and really uh -huh. much more uh, closer, I would say, to design practice. Although Augusto Ball does not provide this philosophical framework that Freire provides, they are doing, uh, they, are, they were working different fields uh, and it's all connected and we, we can really have some kind of uh, a major breakthrough, I would say change in design theory and design practice if we go uh, more deeper into these readings, just, not just reading by say acknowledging that these authors exist, but really looking at the con historical context where, why did they propose this and what they have done later on and what people have done subsequently inspired by these authors in other fields so we can really have a better reading and that's uh, what I, I really love from this book club that you're really trying to uh, do this kind of a hist cultural historical context together with the discussion. Thank you everyone for, for your questions it was really cool and if you want to contact me later on uh, I can provide more 